Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold, and whenever I get a chance to talk to a missionary, I always get very excited because they're doing amazing work. My guest today is Andrew Gorski. He is uh, living in Poland and doing incredible work over there. And I'm always uh, happy to to meet uh, a missionary. Andrew, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Well, let's first start getting things correct because I know that you've Americanized your name, Andrew Gorski, for me. But just give everyone a chance to hear it, how it should be pronounced. Yes, I did. I just wanted to make your life a little bit easier. And you my, are. My true name is Andrzej Górski. That's how, you, <laughs> that's how we say it in Poland. Andrzej Górski. Something like that. Yes, you're yeah. close. <laughs> I don't think I did a very good job. But uh, first of all, I, I love uh, what you're doing, but I also want to hear, tell me how you came to faith in Christ. Yeah, that's an interesting story. Um, I am from Poland, so like... Pretty much everyone over there in the country, I was born into a Catholic family, and um, uh, and uh, I did not know God personally. Uh, for me, God was religion. I would go to church every Sunday, sometimes even more often, but I did not know Christ personally. And um, in my high school days, I fell in love, imagine that, with Chicago Bulls, Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, and the other guys. And, <laughs> and I watched uh, them play uh, every single day. What I would do back in the 90s, of course, there was no the internet, so I would record the game on my VCR, and that because of the time change, it was, you know, 2 a.m. in the morning, my time, so I, I was sleeping then. But I would record it. I would, uh, in the morning, I would wake up uh, and see if we won. The Chicago Bulls won. This was we. This was my team. Um, and then and then I went to school and came back and uh, and watched it every single day for four, three hours, four hours. And you oh. know what? Bob Costas was my personal teacher. He doesn't know that, but he spoke to me for four hours for years, and that's how I speak English. So, um, so yeah, so I fell in love and always wanted to see NBA game live, and then I went to law school, and after year four, I uh, came here to States for a summer job on a work and travel program, and um, and one day in, in Boston, Massachusetts, went playing basketball in the evening. I had all the time in the world, and was I was here on my own, and and somebody uh, wh- whom I met on the basketball court turned out he was a church planter, and he invited me over to his home for for a Bible study, and uh, and I came there, and you know I had been going to church all my life, but I have never seen what I saw there, which was people praying with their own words, people talking about God like like he was in the room, like he was normal, he was part of their lives. I was blown away by it. And uh, it took God 10 weeks to get a hold of my heart. And uh, 10 weeks later, I gave my life to Christ. Um, And everything changed. And, you know, summarizing it, if it wasn't for Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls and Bob Costas, I would not be saved today. So praise the Lord for those guys. That's a fantastic story. I've always been fascinated when I hear stories like yours where you listen to Bob Costas speak. And if I started listening to uh, some Polish commentator in Poland... When am I going to one day understand what he's saying? I don't even understand how that worked. Well, but I, uh, but I can share, you, uh, share with you one thing. You know, Polish, like you heard my name, Andrzej Górski, uh, is very, very difficult. One of the most difficult languages in the world. But there's one very important spiritual fact that I don't know, Bill, if you know or if our listeners know, that Polish will be spoken in heaven. And do you know why? <laughs> why is that? Because it takes eternity to learn it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. So, uh, Andrew, when you talk about uh, your upbringing in Catholicism, and, and Poland is largely a Catholic country, is that right? That's right. Yeah, and I grew up Catholic myself, so I have a tremendous love for my my fellow brothers and sisters who who love the Catholic Church, and, and many, many, many came to love and know Jesus as Savior. But but you talk about uh, Catholics not necessarily um, understanding uh, self. I don't know what you were, how you phrased it, but you said something that that they didn't uh, 
you didn't know Jesus. And I thought, well, Catholics would say, if you say to them, do you believe in Jesus? I'd say 100% of Catholics would say, yes, I do. Yes. Uh, for me, the difference is because in Poland, most of people believe there is God. Uh, but knowing the gospel and mm-hmm. trusting with your life uh, uh, at what Jesus Christ did, did for you and that his death was everything that was needed for, for my salvation, that's, that's the difference. Uh, and another, another difference is uh, growing, growth, growing in faith, uh, being discipled. And reading the Bible, and I, um, I just didn't have that in my in my first twenty three years of my life. Mm-hmm. And Andrew, I would say helping religious people come to Christ is one of the bigger challenges. Yes, obviously, obviously it is. Uh, in my case, uh, I had to leave my country and and come here, and God used this. Uh, my sister, for some reason, came to faith in England when she was away. Um, there is something about. Uh, a place uh, like Poland, m- maybe other countries as well, I don't know, uh, where we have been one religion only um, for thousand, over a thousand years, and it's just, uh, it's just hard to come to faith there. I don't know. That some people do come. My, 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 my uh, wife came to faith um, in Poland uh, through a ministry that, that we're doing, but, uh, but for some reason it is harder there, so it seems, to come to faith. Mm-hmm. Andrew, you've got a lot of ambition. You've got a pretty big vision. You want to unite believers and churches across Poland. That's pretty ambitious. Yes, there is, it is. Uh, and it's, uh, it's not me. It's of God. But uh, it all started with, uh, with me hearing a story of how God works in France. And I don't know, Bill, if you, uh, if you know that in France, there is a church planted every 12 days. Um, evangelicals came together a few years ago to speak with one voice to government, to media, to society. Uh, and the church, as a result of this and many other things that what, what, which God did, uh, grew 1,000% in the last 50 years. Wow. When I heard about it, I was so overwhelmed, and I thought, wow, how cool it would be if we could work together as Polish evangelicals um, to, uh, to share the gospel. And evangelical believers make up two-tenths of one percent in Poland of the society. Two-tenths of one percent. Wow. So, very small. Yeah, very small. And unfortunately, we had this sad saying uh, that Polish church is small, but well divided. <laughs> yeah, cool. unfortunately, we have seven main denominations, and historically, we have not been working with each other very well. So when I heard the French story, I thought, I, I thought to myself, God, wouldn't that be great if we had a vision a strategy that we would work together to accomplish your goal, which is to to strengthen the church and and and, and bring people to to salvation. So um, so yeah, five years ago, it was a big vision. It was just something that I believe Holy Spirit inspired me back at that conference when I heard of what God was doing in France. And uh, and then uh, you know the story developed. I went to denominational leaders, shared my heart, and said, Hey, do we have anything like this? Do we have a vision? And they said, uh, no, we don't. I mean, everybody's working. Each denomination is trying to do what they can. But we do not work together. We don't have a strategy or vision for the nation. Mm. So, um, so you know, we met again, uh, worked for a year uh, on a vision. And then five years ago, first time in the history of our country, um, it was we have signed the vision. We signed the vision for evangelical church growth in Poland by 2050, which... The main goals are to go from two tenths of one percent to one percent evangelical by 2050, and to go from 700 churches for 38 million people to 5,000 churches by 2050. That's our big vision. Wow, fantastic! Andrew Gorski is my guest. So, Andrew, you started this co- collaboration movement uh, what five years ago? That's exactly right. Yeah. So you woke up one morning, had a couple of cups of strong coffee, and said, "I'm going to start something really big." Not exactly. Not exa- not, not exactly. Uh, it was, um, again, I heard of this f- story of the French church at one conference, and I okay. came back from this conference, and I could not let go of this thought. And I, one week, two weeks, one month, two months was passing by after the conference, and I was thinking about it every day. Yeah. And I just asked, God, are you trying to tell me something? That's, yeah. that's how it started. So it wasn't, it wasn't strong coffee. 
Okay, we well, got me thinking about it now too. I mean, just this is amazing. Uh, just remind me again of the number of churches that are being planted in France. Th- th- those statistics are unbelievable. Yeah, uh, I can't remember what it is uh, on annual basis, but I remember I did the math, and it's every 12 days a new church is being planted. And they're French. They have a strategy for planting churches. They have a great organization called CNEF, uh, which which is the heart of their collaboration there. Mm-hmm. So I want to learn a little bit more now, Andrew, if I could, about the um, the Evangelical um, Impact Center. Yes. Um, and, and just maybe before we go to the Impact Center, uh, yeah. our thing is if we are to grow church from two-tenths of one percent to one percent to to change the history, because our country has been Catholic for over 1,000 years, um, there has it had there has to be collaboration. There has to be, and there's no collaboration if there's no trust. Right. So we believe trust is the the, well, it's not the end goal. Trust is the means with which we will strengthen the church and we'll work together. But in order to have trust, people need to have relationships with each other. They need to become friends. And if they are to have relationships, they need to meet somewhere. They need to uh, spend time together. They need to pray together. So um, so the large, the huge vision to grow the church in Poland five times is through strengthening relationships between leaders and pastors, equipping them um, and training them. And uh, the best way to do it for me is to have a place where they could come together, when they could be at conferences, be at seminars, but also spend long evenings talking, dreaming, praying together. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and there is no such place in the entire northwestern part of Poland where 10 million people left, leave, live. There is no single Christian conference training center uh, and over there. So this is our dream to start one. Well, I'm, I'm stunned by that, Andrew. And I know uh, if there is not one conference center uh, here in America, th- there's tons and tons of conference centers and they are very, uh, um, they're very critical for getting bodies of believers together to pray, to dream and to equip one another y- yeah. uh, to do ministry. Yeah. You know, when I travel around and visit uh, you know your church's large buildings and large conference centers. Some, some, what I'm encouraged. Some, what I'm devastated. Looking at it, uh, of course, I'm, I'm, uh, I am uh, joking now. But, uh, uh, but yeah, it's uh, you know how it is, and each church know how it. How, each church knows how important it is to have the building, the facility to to do the ministry. And over there, there's just that this just does not exist. So, uh, so we would like to make a huge change, huge transformation, and start uh, a place like this, which would which would be a multi-purpose place for camps, summer camps, because we need people to come to faith. And the best, one of the best ways to, for people to come to faith is to participate at summer camps. So summer camps, then conferences, events, youth events, uh, conferences, Christian conferences, Bible school, local church will move there to this place. And by the way, uh, because there's only 700 churches for 38 million people, this is an area where 154,000 people live and there is no single Christian, biblical, evangelical church there, and there there has never been any biblical presence there. So, it wow. will be it will be transformational. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to take a break, Andrew. When I come back, I want to hear a lot more about your vision. Um, has a shovel gone into the ground yet? Have you started building? Is this? A... No, we ha- we haven't. We are in the process uh, okay. of getting there. We're close, but we have not done that yet. Okay. Let me get, let me pick up when we come back after the break. Uh, Andrew Gorski is my guest. And he has uh, got quite a vision for uh, ministry and evangelism in the country of Poland. We'll take a short break and be right back. Welcome back to the show. Andrew Gorski is my guest. I love a man with a vision, especially one for the Lord. And boy, does he got a big one. He is uh, wanting to break ground on uh, um, an evangelical training center in in Poland. There's nothing like it over there. And his uh, desire is to bring churches together and to uh, do a collaborative effort. Uh, Andrew, when you talk about collaboration, I would love to hear more because this whole process to me is just fascinating. Yeah, and I, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, the church, uh, at least in Poland, and I hear of other stories, unfortunately, in Europe as well, that the church's uh, denominations sometimes don't work with each other, do not support each other, like we were not in the same kingdom. Uh, so my heart just cries when I see 
us not working with each other, not supporting, not helping, not not encouraging each other. And sometimes, you know, it starts even with just liking, I don't know, Facebook post of another church and putting the like, uh, you know, sign or something because it starts with our, with our heart. So, um, so yeah, so we, uh, with the vision of going to 1% and splinting, going to 5,000 churches, planting 4,300 churches the next um, 27 years, um, we've started talking about, hey, let's dream, let's pray together as Christian leaders, pastors for our country, and let's see what God will do. And uh, short, long story short, in five years, the, the vision, the idea that just started um, five years ago is now the largest collaboration movement of evangelical pastors, leaders, and churches in the country with one-third of the churches participating in at least one project, which is unheard of, and it's just how beautifully God works in us and through us uh, over there in Poland. Yeah, Andrew, us uh, Americans may have trouble putting our arms around how significant what you just said is, because we're, we're used to all kinds of collaboration and and centers that we can go to for retreats and training and equipping and, and fellowship and all that. And this is just uh, kind of new new for us to hear for Poland. Yeah, um, it's a different world over there. Um, uh, you know, there's we're talking about one-fourth of the country that does not have a place like this. Uh, and 10 million people live there. So wow. think of it's North huge. Carolina or Michigan. Both those states have around 10 million people. So if you want to, you know, if you want, to, if you want church to grow, if you want people to to be strengthened to be equipped i mean there is there has to be a place where they would go a bible school or something obviously you could do online a lot of things but again if we are to 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 build relationships and especially for people and leaders from different denominations uh i think it the it comes down to seeing our hearts each other's hearts because we may have some secondary issues theological differences or something but if we learn if we get to know each other and if we know of each other's hearts then there's a uh, theological difference go away and we we then can do something together for the kingdom of God, which again is so tiny over there. Mm-hmm. I heard a pastor say years and years ago how important it is that Christians are face-to-face, that they have meals together, that they pray together, that they start talking to each other, because he says that's where so many amazing ideas come from, um, yeah, I, just you, being together. We And we know that if you have two leaders and leaders, usually they're high D people. They have a lot of, uh, um, you know, um, how do you say this, inspirations, uh, you know, uh, dreams. And you put two guys like this in a room or on a sofa after a long conference and they start talking, they start dreaming, they start discussing. Sooner or later, you'll they'll have a project. They'll come up with a project. And, and that's what it's all about. It's, it is God working through us and in us. But there needs to be a safe place. There needs to be a, a collaboration, collaboration platform. And God has been using this uh, platform of evangelical, Pol- evangelical Poland so far as, uh, as we have not seen in our country mm-hmm. ever before. Mm-hmm. And Andrew, th- is this going to be the Evangelical Poland Impact Center? Is that the working title of this? Uh, That's this? the working si- title, Evangelical Poland Impact Center, which stands for EPIC. Epic. So when people come in there, we want them, and God wants them, to have an epic life, to to have uh, influence, to to really um, influence the society, influence their local communities, influence their churches. So yes, epic it is. Yeah, I want to hear more stories, if you don't mind, about what God has been doing in these last five years and some of the things that you've seen that have uh, just given you great in- encouragement and inspiration. Yeah, um, we've started with uh, with nothing. We've started with just an idea. Uh, and uh, started sharing the idea, and um, pastors and leaders came together. A lot of people are tired of uh, us being such a large, such a a small, uh, uh, insignificant, actually, church, because, again, we are in a Catholic country with 90% people, you know, saying they're Catholic. We're just two-tenths of one percent. So once we started talking, once we started collaborating, beautiful projects came came up, of uh, like mentoring academy when we when we find people who will who would mentor each other which has not been happening much in the church you know we come from communist days uh 
the problem in our culture, not only in Poland, but the entire Eastern Europe, is, is lack of trust towards each other. In society, unfortunately, it translates into the church as well. So, so our, our, our thing is to build the trust. And it's a little bit harder than here, if, for example, in the U.S. So, um, so getting together, praying together, um, and, uh, and doing evangelistic uh, projects together, uh, having a strategy for ch- planting churches in the country, uh, it has just been a wonderful, wonderful uh, ride, so to speak. Uh, and it's only been five years. Uh, uh, so we have no idea what God will do in the next 10, 15 years. But in the meantime, obviously, uh, a war in Ukraine started with Ukraine, with, with which being our neighbor, and two million refugees came to our country. And uh, just uh, just because we have Holy Spirit, all of us, and, be, and because we collaborate, it was so much easier to now work with each other to welcome those people. And pretty much, we, and you know this from, from news, I mean, there were no refugee camps in Poland. Everyone took their, the, the, took the refugees, usually women and kids, to their homes, as I did with, with my wife. We had a, a mom with three kids at our home for, for six months. Uh, there was just nothing else we would think we could do. I mean, just we, 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 take, we took them and uh, took care of them. So the church over there, even though it's small, really passed the test of love. So... Um, you can be proud of you know your brothers and sisters over there in Eastern Europe. Oh, I am proud of them. Uh, I would just be so curious to hear more about what that experience was like. Uh, this you know beautiful family getting driven out of Ukraine. There's and a great, showing up in your home. Yeah, there's a great story there. You know, I am a missionary in Poland, and I come here to the U.S. and I am so warmly welcomed. I stay with great people, you know, and it's just God really takes care of me and my family here. Now. The story how we ended up with this family is this. Uh, I don't know, five days after the war started, we get a text message from somebody. We don't know, just an, a, 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 any number, any cell phone number. And the, it, the text said, family uh, of mom and three kids looking for a place to stay. And it's February. It's Eastern Europe. It's freezing outside. I look at the text, look at my wife. She looks at me and we go like, yeah, sure. Let's take it. Wow. We didn't know. <laughs> no. Yeah. So, so. So then we said, yes, we'll take him. I don't know who it, who it wrote again. I, today, until today, I don't know. And we said, yes, we'll take them. And the text said to somebody in pride, okay, they'll be, tomorrow they'll be in your town. Ten minutes later, I got a text. Well, actually, they are already in your town. And we are like eight hours away from Ukrainian border. So the time over there was so chaotic. But anyway, it turns out they are in our town. They're already waiting to be picked up. So we just went to, to, uh, to pick them up. You know, with, with two cars, we went there. We picked them up. And the mom went in another car and I took the kids in another in, in this car and they were kind of scared because they didn't know us. We didn't know them. And, and they said like, hey, uh, so where are we going? And all this is they, you know, again, distrust because it's it's Eastern Europe. Um, and, and I said, hey, uh, what, what do you do? What do your father, what does your father do? And they said, my father is a pastor. And I said, no kidding. I am a pastor too. And they go <laughs> like, wow, that's unbelievable. Now, two tenths of of 1% evangelical Christians in the country, and now God taking care of this refugee family by putting them into a pastor's house in Poland. I mean, statistically, it's impossible to happen, but like you guys, the church here in the U.S. takes good care of, of us. I, I, I thought, like, this was God's sense of humor or God's love, how he took care of the family through, through us over there in Poland in the beginning wow. of the war. Andrew, Andrew, that was just a phenomenal story. Um, thank you for sharing that. Of course, God has a way of just knitting people together, and this poor family is coming out of Ukraine, probably scared half to death, and now they're in a strange person's car going to their home. I understand how there would be like little to no trust, not not to mention the trauma that they just had experienced. Oh yeah, they they were you know a trip that normally would take I don't know eight hours, seven hours on train. They they took them three three days. Uh, you know, with just standing in the tr- on the train. Uh, I mean, oh. it was it was really really terrible. But again, it's not only us. Um, so many people, believers and even unbelievers in Poland, took them to uh, to their homes, and um, I, I, it was just a great in the tragedy of the situation. It was a great uh, way of how God really showed through the through His church, and again, small church, uh, that we can do anything if we work together and if we are in the center of His will. Mm-hmm. We just have a couple of minutes left, Andrew. What, how is the family of God coming around you and your family trying to help uh, raise funds to purchase property for the training center? Yeah, uh, you know what? I am a Eastern European, and uh, I, I came here a few times this year, shared my heart, shared my vision. 
would anybody would be interested in in, in transforming central central Eastern Europe for God by you know by partnering in in this in this thing? And you know what? Uh, I look at my I look at myself as a just regular guy. Again, I'm I'm Polish, and God provided 1.4 million dollars in donations and pledges oh, so wow. far. And for me, it's maybe Bill, you do it every day. Maybe maybe you do, but for me, it is just absolutely absolute miracle. I know I'll be sharing this story until to, to my grandkids when I grow up or when they grow up because it's just it's absolutely impossible uh, to happen. But God did it. Yeah. Andrew, if someone wanted to go online and look at your vision, what website would they go to? Uh, The best way would be to go to Avant Ministries uh, website. uh, A-V-A-N-T? A-V-A-N-T dot org. Yeah, A-V-A-N-T dot org. And that's where they can uh, look up uh, Epic Evangelical Poland Training Center. So website is A-V-A-N-T dot org, and that will get them to the right place. Oh, I'm sorry. It's uh, it's, uh, Avant ministries.org okay. avant, avant ministries.org that's what ministries.org I, I i believe if you do if you if you google epic uh, christian training center in poland i think you, it will take you to the right to the right website okay thank you so much uh andrew for being on the program it's just been a delight meeting you well it's been a pleasure uh, sharing our heart and our vision for our country and thank you for having us and if you are listening and you want to pray for poland we would really really uh be thankful for that Trust me, my listeners will do that. They, 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 I can tell they love you already. I do too. Thank you so much. Thank for being you so on the much, show. Bill. You bet. Andrew Gorski has been on, uh, my guest. They go to avantministries.org, A V A N T, learn more about his, uh, his vision. All right, we're going to take a little break and we'll be right back. Welcome to the show. Every time I have Dr. Greg Headington on, my dear, dear friend, I always think he may be the most prepared guest I have on. So let's not uh, spend too much more time, but let's get into our study. He's going to take us through the book of Exodus and some other Old Testament books. But today we're going to look at Exodus chapter 1 and 2. Greg, welcome, and let's get started. Thanks, Bill. Welcome to our second lesson in the book of Exodus. Now, don't worry about taking notes if you're unable to, but I am going to give an outline with Roman numeral numbers just so we can keep points going. So first point, Roman numeral one, the background for the book of Exodus, which includes a brief review of Genesis. Now in Genesis, we learned that the father of the Jewish people, Abraham, had 12 grandsons living in Canaan, and they were called Hebrews. Let's get some definitions as we get started. How do we know they were called Hebrews? Because it's used for the first time ever when Abram is called a Hebrew in Genesis 14, 17. What does Hebrew mean? Well, the word Hebrew literally means one from the other side of the river, which refers to the Nile River. Why was Abram's name changed? Well, when he was called by God to lead a great nation, his name was Abram. Okay, Abram had no children, and Abram means lofty father, But later, when he's promised to have descendants, quote, as many as the stars in the sky, God tells him in Genesis 17, 4, quote, no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. Abraham means father of a multitude. Later, Hebrews are called Jews. Now, why is that? Well, because they're named after the province of Judea. And our final definition today, I think, is the word Genesis means origin. Now, you may know the plot of Genesis, but let's recall a few salient points. We learned that Abram had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob had 11 sons, and he and his family, numbering 70 in total, moved southwest from Canaan down south to Egypt because of the great famine in Canaan. And we know how famines throughout history have continued tragically to displace people from all over the world. Jacob's family moved to Egypt because his son, Joseph, had politically arisen from his time wasting away in prison to become the second most powerful man in Egypt under Pharaoh. He's given credit, in fact, for saving Egypt from famine 
And you can read all about the details in Genesis 47. So Joseph's family, from which he had been estranged for years, moved to Egypt. They have a wonderful family reunion, and they all live happily ever after. Well, at least for a while. But after a few years, things go off the rails when we read one of the most ominous verses in all of Scripture. Roman numeral 2, Exodus chapter 1, verse 8 says, Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Yikes. That's not from Scripture. That's my comment. This new pharaoh will turn the peaceful existence of Jacob's family in Egypt into 430 years of enslavement for the entire Hebrew race. Now, there are many fascinating anecdotes, historical details, spiritual insights, and apical lessons for us to consider as we study at least two chapters each lesson in Exodus. And you'll find great joy in reading the book of Exodus. So I'll just give the plot of the first two chapters of Exodus mixed with a few points, which I want to emphasize. Roman numeral three, the plot of Exodus chapter one. Exodus 1.8 says a king comes to power in Egypt who had not known of Joseph and how he had saved Egypt from famine. I want to say a few words about remembering, which apply to all of us. There's a recurring theme of the importance of remembering mentioned in the five books of the Torah. When I say Torah, that's the five first books of the Old Testament. And the harm that occurs to the Israelite people when they do not remember. In Exodus 2.24, God says, Remember my covenant with Abraham. In Exodus 13, 3, Moses urges his people to remember this day. In Exodus 20, verse 8, the Israelites are ordered to remember the Sabbath day. And that's regarding the Ten Commandments, which command that they are to observe Passover as a day of remembrance. Moses intends to build a community that remembers. Nations also must remember their past, and I am concerned that our American students are not being taught well about our own American history. There is the maxim that says those who do not remember the past are doomed to repeat it. And the Jews throughout the world have their own two phrases, never forget and never again, which of course are referring to the six million Jews exterminated in Nazi concentration camps. Those words could also refer to the retelling of the Jewish exodus out of Egypt after 430 years of slavery to reinforce remembering what occurred to the Hebrew race. So a new king comes to power in Egypt who does not remember how Joseph had saved the nation from famine. Meanwhile, God had blessed the 12 tribes over the years, so they multiplied, but they were viewed as a threat by this new pharaoh. Why? Because they there was a fear among the he that the Hebrews might align themselves with Egypt's enemies. So, Bill, we're in the first chapter of uh, Exodus. Yeah, I love this this study, Greg. Dr. Greg Heddington is my guest as we are going to look through a number of books in the Old Testament. But for today, we're working through Exodus 1 and 2. Let's continue. So the Egyptians are nervous about the Hebrews. So in order to protect the interest of Egypt, Pharaoh begins oppressing the Israelites through slavery. But the more the Israelites are oppressed, the more they grow in numbers. This results in even more severe measures taken against the Israelites. Pharaoh then devises a new scheme to thin out the Hebrew population when he orders two particular Hebrew midwives to organize the plan to kill all male Jewish babies after their birth while leaving the daughters alive. Now, why would they leave the daughters alive? Well, the daughters pose no military threat. But the midwives, with their holy fear of God, these two women refuse the king's orders and preserve the male children. This takes tremendous courage on the part of the midwives to disobey Pharaoh's orders. And I am convinced that moral courage is the rarest of all traits. There are far more kind people than there are courageous people. In our daily battle against evil, all good traits amount to very little unless they are accompanied by courage. So here's a question. Do we courageously speak the truth about what Scripture says regarding moral and ethical truths? 
and injustice and speak about Jesus being the way we live and the one we follow, even though it might make us uncomfortable and people around us uncomfortable. Here are two points regarding courage. First, the Hebrew midwives show courage by refusing to murder Jewish male babies. So Pharaoh commands all Egyptian people to murder newborn Hebrew boys. That's all Hebrew, uh, all Egyptian people by throwing them into the Nile River. Now, I think it's very interesting for us to notice that by listing the names of the two heroic midwives, the Torah is making a powerful moral point. We tend to remember the names of villains, but not the names of the truly good. For example, in Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar, at the funeral of Caesar, Mark Anthony stands up to give the eulogy and he says this, the evil men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. And here in scripture, the Torah wants to ensure that the good names of Shifra and Pura are remembered. However, the Torah never mentions the proper name of the evil Pharaoh. Pharaoh, by the way, is just a title, not a name. And so to this day, the names of two lowly Hebrew midwives are known, but not the names of the extraordinarily powerful Pharaoh. The second point regarding courage is this. People fear those who are more powerful than they. That's always been true. Therefore, the only way to not fear powerful people is to fear God. After all, God's the one who runs everything. He's the one we must follow and the one who is above all else. In this instance, those who feared God saved Hebrew babies, mm. while those who feared Pharaoh helped drown Hebrew babies. So chapter one of Exodus ends in a cliffhanger as things do not look good for the Hebrews in Egypt. Now the plot thickens. Roman numeral four, the plot of Exodus chapter two. As in any great heroic story, our hero is now introduced. When we read mythology, the births of great men in Greek, Roman, and Egyptian mythology, they always have miraculous events that occur at their births, and then the gods favor particularly men who are good-looking and have superhuman abilities, even as children. But Scripture does not describe what Moses looked like. My guess is he did not look like Charlton Heston, who we see in the movies playing him, and his birth is not spectacular. God chooses Moses to lead the Hebrews because of his exceptional moral and leadership traits, but he's a normal moral. And once again, women play central and courageous roles in the early chapters. Moses' mother, Jochebed, from the Levite tribe, gives birth to Moses, and because of Pharaoh's mandate to drown all newborn Hebrew boys, she takes a basket and hides Moses in the bulrushes in the river. Moses' older sister, Miriam, keeps an eye on that basket from a distance and sees that Pharaoh's daughter comes down to the river to bathe and notices that the basket has a baby inside it, which she recognizes as a Hebrew, Hebrew baby. How does she recognize it? Well, it could be the baby's clothes. We're not sure. So Miriam sees that the baby has been forced by Pharaoh's daughter, excuse me, found by Pharaoh's daughter, and dashes over to suggest that Pharaoh's daughter call a Hebrew woman to nurse the child. Pharaoh's daughter agrees, and Miriam goes back to get Moses over uh, his own mother to feed and care for the baby she bore, after which Pharaoh's daughter, after a few years, takes Moses as her own, naming him Moses, which literally means to draw out. And Moses is reared and educated as an Egyptian. Here's the point to remember. Another example of female moral courage. Pharaoh's daughter knows the baby is a Hebrew, which emphasizes her moral greatness. How ironic it is that the daughter of this evil Pharaoh, who is enslaved and hopes to annihilate the entire Hebrew race, this daughter is the one who saves the Israelites by saving and caring for Moses. How remarkable that the Torah includes this fact about women. As we continue the study, we see the Torah is surprisingly inclusive, not racist, it, it uh, lacks hatred toward these cruel Egyptians. The message is clear. Even though a pharaoh has a genocidal hatred of the pharaohs, his daughter is a great humanitarian. Now, I think, Bill, it's time for a break. Yeah, let's do that. Dr. Greg Heddington is my guest as we're studying uh, First and Second Exodus. We're going to be in this study for a while, and we're going to continue to look at several books of the Old Testament with Greg. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.
So glad to be studying the book of Exodus with my friend, Dr. Greg Hennington. We are in chapter one and two. Greg, let's pick up where we left off. Well, Bill, we've been talking about uh, Exodus chapters one and two, and we're just about making uh, two points that we learned from the Torah about what we've learned. Uh, first of all, we find that the Torah is, is surprisingly objective. As I mentioned earlier, it's amazing. It's, it's not uh, male chauvinistic. It's not racist. It's not ethnocentristic. Uh, and it has a lack of hatred toward these cruel Egyptians, which to me is amazing. Second point is biology is not destiny. You can be the child of an evil person, but that does not mean you have, that is your destiny. Nor can it be an excuse for living an unethical life. So you can still be a good person. And of course, it reminds us of the Pharaoh's daughter who knew that this was a Hebrew baby she was taking care of. And yet she courageously raised it uh, to be her own and to grow up in the palace of the Pharaoh. Now, the parallels between Moses and Jesus are clear. The baby Moses is rescued uh, from Pharaoh's mandate to drown all Hebrew babies. And Jesus is rescued after birth from Herod's mandate to kill all Jewish male children under the age of two in the Bethlehem area. Also, God chose Moses to deliver his people out of slavery in Egypt. And Jesus saved his people from the slavery from sin. More parallels will follow. And now between verses 10 and 11 of chapter 2, we discover that Moses is now an adult. And according to Acts 7, verse 23, Moses is now 40 years old. So we're moving into Roman numeral 5, Moses after age 40. Now, being reared as an Egyptian, and remember, animals are raised, but people are reared. Moses recognized that he is also a Hebrew. How so? Well, children in the ancient world were often nursed until three years of age, and Moses' mother would have likely wanted to maximize her time with him, so it's quite possible she taught him that he was a Hebrew. Also, Exodus 4.14 makes it clear that Moses knew his brother Aaron, and we know he knew his sister. Also, it's likely in Pharaoh's court their resentful Egyptians most likely would have reminded Moses of his lowly Hebrew background. After all, we know how cruel children can be to other children. It's also possible that Pharaoh's daughter, who reared Moses after Moses was three years old, told him he was a Hebrew. One thing we do know, somehow Moses knew the truth about his real identity, and he was interested in what was happening to his fellow Hebrews. As verse 11 says, one day Moses went out to see his people and saw their burden. Well, what was Moses doing before that day? I mean, was he hanging out in Pharaoh's court, working on his swordsmanship? We don't know. But when he goes out this particular day, he sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. If he had gone outside his court, bubble more often, he would have seen this probably every day. Nonetheless, now Moses sees it and he's enraged. Scripture does not mention whether Moses tries to persuade the Egyptian from beating the Hebrew, but even if he did, his words were not effective. It is clear to Moses what he will do. He looks all around to see if anyone is watching. It appears no one's watching, so he kills the Egyptian, tries to hide his crime by burying his body in the sand, and now for anyone who would try to protect a lowly slave, much less a slave who killed an Egyptian, and remember Egyptians were in the were the favored class. A criminal act such as this would be a death sentence of that person. If Moses were caught, he would be executed. We know this because verse 15 says, when Pharaoh heard of this, he wanted to find Moses and kill him. Yikes. So Whoa. much for the goodwill Moses had accrued, accrued by living in Pharaoh's court all those years. The next day, one of the Hebrew men tells Moses he had heard about his murder of the Egyptian. So now Moses freaks out because his felonies public knowledge and he knows his face will be on the wall of every post office in the country, so he runs for his life. I mean, he really runs. The next time we see him, he is 300 miles away in the land of Midian. Now the plot moves quickly. As Moses sits down by the wall, he sees seven young ladies caring for their father's flocks. It's an important number, by the way, number seven. Mm -hmm. so, 
some unruly shepherds pass by and scare the daughters away so their own sheep can drink. Our hero, Moses, now steps into the scene of injustice. We don't know how many shepherds there are that bully the girls, and we don't know what Moses says. He could have called them every name but a child of God. We don't know. But we do know this one felon from the law, Moses, on the run, drives away multiple bullies and strikes a note for justice. The daughters return home and tell their father, named Jethro, who's the priest of Midian, that this courageous Egyptian man had defended them. Jethro invites Moses to join their family for a meal. Jethro eventually gives one of his daughters, named Zipporah, to Moses to be his wife, hopefully after he has a few dinner dates with her. <laughs> and later, they have a son named Gershom. And the second 40-year segment of Moses' life begins in Midian as he cares for his father-in-law's flock. Chapter 2 has a portentous ending, as we learn that Pharaoh, who had attempted to kill Moses, is now dead, but we soon learn that the new Pharaoh is just as cruel, and the Hebrews continue to cry out for help to God because of their never-ending slavery under the Egyptians' continues. The last verse in chapter 2 is another cliffhanger when it says, God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. Now, here's something to keep in mind throughout the Torah. When Scripture says God knew, it means God will act. And when Scripture says God remembered, it does not mean God had forgotten. It's a Hebrew figure of speech, which also means God decided to act. Now, remember, the Hebrews were God's covenant people. What does covenant mean? This is a definition you want to remember because we'll be using it. Covenant in Hebrew means to bind. In the Old Testament scripture, covenant is a firm commitment, a solemn vow, a safe haven, a promise, a certainty. And our Lord God will answer the cries of his covenant people in Egypt for help through miraculous events such that the world had never seen before and has not seen since. Here's my last point, Roman numeral six. Why the choice for Moses to lead was already apparent. There are three reasons why Moses is the exceptional man chosen by Yahweh to deliver the Israelites out of bondage. First, Moses does not have a slave mentality. Unlike his fellow Hebrews who were so demoralized they could only cry out to God to save them, Moses does not share their demoralized attitude, and he does not merely cry out. He takes action. Second, Moses will later command the respect of the Israelites in part because he was reared as Egyptian and not reared among the Hebrew, who, Hebrews who were in slavery. That made him far more worldly wise than the people who were reared as slaves. Furthermore, the Israelites must have admired this man who chooses to be someone who will not ignore what, what, he's, been, what he's been shown by God about the injustice going on around him, where he could have lived a charmed life as an Egyptian prince. Third, Moses fights evil. He is instinctively intolerant of suffering and injustice. Most people, when confronted with evil directed against others, look away. They're too frightened to confront it. As I noted earlier, moral courage is the rarest of all good traits. And I end with this. There are three possible responses to evil. Number one, fight back. Moses certainly fought back by killing the cruel Egyptian. Number two, speak out. When Moses saw the shepherds who bullied the women, he spoke out against them and scared them away. Three, stand. Moses will stand before Pharaoh very soon. But here's the crucial point. God chose Moses not just because he fights against evil, but because he knows which of the three responses is most appropriate in any given situation. The question for us today is, how is God calling us to respond to the evil and, and injustice that are around us every day? Do we fight? Do we speak out? Do we stand? And do we know which one to do at the right time? Bill, that's what I have to say for oh, today. I, Greg, the practical applications at the end were spectacular, as the, was the whole teaching. So thank you very thank much. You. I look forward to continuing this uh, discussion. Dr. Greg Heddington has been my guest. And if you missed any of this, please check out the podcast. It's wonderful teaching. We're going to take a little break and we'll be right back.
Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.